Hi guys, welcome to today's video. Sorry about the light, it's just really sunny, but also like windy and rainy and all the weather in the UK today. I didn't know what I was going to do for today's video, but I have to film today. Today's Sunday. And I know I don't upload until Saturday, but I like to have everything like organised. So we're going for a walk tomorrow. I've got the electrician coming on Tuesday again. Uh, so today is my only... Today is when I want to film. So yeah. Uh, but I'm just going to do like a frequently asked... A frequently asked questions video, <laughs> video today. So yeah, just like short questions that don't really warrant a whole video, but people ask me. So uh, the first one... Do you know, I've not even put the question on that. I wanted to talk about. So I'll do that one first. So uh, there's a TikTok going around at the moment or like a few weeks ago, I don't keep up with these things, about putting aerial roots in water and apparently if you do that you'll spontaneously cause another leaf to grow. Um, I'm not saying it isn't true because clearly like I'm sure she wouldn't have made the TikTok, that sounds so naive. Um, but it, you know, it it will have happened, and I'm not saying that putting aerial roots in water is a bad thing, but also it's not this miracle thing. It's just, you know, she put an aerial root in water and it grew another leaf. I don't think there's really a causation thing there. It's one of those things. Absolutely try it. Like it won't hurt your plant, but don't expect amazing things. The primary function of aerial roots is to help the plant grow up it attaches to other trees with aerial roots that's what they're for they're not for they can, they can absorb a bit of nutrition especially as they get older and they get more aerial roots because a lot of plants with aerial roots are semi-epiphytic so they have their roots in the ground but as they grow up they get more air root, air, ugh, aerial roots and stuff but that isn't something we'll be having in our homes the aerial roots that isn't a function that we need them for because they'll be in soil unless you you know want to grow a monstera up a, up a tree in your home each to their own but that isn't the thing so yeah try putting it in water but don't expect anything amazing to happen something might happen nothing might happen uh, it's not like a hack it's something you can try that might get a result uh, right second question is <laughs> For all the lazy people that want to do well for their plants, can you fertilise your plants every time you water them? Yeah, you can. Loads of people do. What I would worry about is fertilising them when they're not growing because you can just do a lot more harm than good because they don't use nutrition so you just end up basically overload like, what's it called? Like, like heavy metal poisoning but for your soil. Your soil will just fill up with nutrients that your plant can't use. Yeah, or, and if you are planning on fertilising every time you water, really, really dilute the mix. So I always recommend diluting it to half the amount the manufacturer recommends anyway, just to be safe. But really, really like reduce it down, probably like a tenth of what the manufacturer recommends if you want to do it every time. Uh, it is easier because it's that way you don't need to think about scheduling. <laughs> I'm really sorry about the light. Yeah, if you want to go for it. If you're using aquarium water, absolutely use it every time. Depending on the type of fish you have, how heavily stocked your tank is, will depend on how strong a fertiliser it is. We have a fairly like, we've got a, it's like a 240 litre tank I think. And it's like fairly heavily stocked but with fish that don't produce a lot of waste. So... Um, we've got angelfish, I suppose they do. It's like medium. Um, so I could probably get away with never fertilising my plants properly with like a fertiliser. But yeah, it's just something sort of you have to look. If your plants aren't growing very well, then maybe you need a supplementary fertiliser. Uh, on another note, um, so when if you have an aquarium and you use aquarium water, you'll know that when you clean out the filter you get, my boyfriend calls it hummus, but it's hummus, humus, <laughs> it's not hummus. Like the, the, the uh, literally crap that accumulates in the filter and you can use that on your plants and it will be incredible for them but it will smell just to warn you about that 
Uh, right, question three. I'm going to number them because they're all out of whack now. There was another one I wanted to... Oh, <laughs> I was going to do like, how do you keep on top of your houseplant schedules? But mine is, um, I basically neglect them until they look like they're going to die. And then I um, bring them back from the brink and the cycle repeats. Right, what houseplants can you grow in rooms with no light? Just get fake ones. It isn't worth the stress on the plant or on you. They're never going to thr thrive. So you've got a really big, well-established snake plant that you didn't want to grow anymore. You could maybe get away with keeping it in a really low light situation, but it wouldn't do well. It would probably look quite sad and you'd have to be really, really careful about watering it. I just personally wouldn't recommend it because unless you're going to fill the room with grow lights, I would just get a fake plant. You can get pretty decent ones nowadays or even like a bunch of flowers. Right, the ideal plant for a gift or for like a first time, if you want to get into plants, what's a great first time plant? I have decided after, like I see all the time, I've, I've got an article on my blog about um, great beginner plants, but I have decided that it's, I'm only now going to recommend Peperomia Hope. And I've talked about this before. I'm sorry, he's in water. Um, they are just such good plants. They are, I don't know what it is about them. They're so like, they've got almost succulent leaves. So you can tell when they need watering because their leaves go quite wrinkly. They're quite hard to overwater because they can store so much water in the roots. No, no, in the leaves. They look cool. They bloom. The blooms are quite, um, I don't have one. I snapped it off. The blooms are quite, they're sort of long and they're not particularly interesting bloom, but it is like, Seeing flowers of any kind on a houseplant that you've nurtured is always exciting no matter what they look like. Apart from anthurium ones because they smell. Like why do anthurium flowers smell? Like not not good. Like what's that weird smell? Like Kind of like a bin smell? Not a fan. Um, yeah, so another thing about Peperomia Hope is they are so easy to propagate and I love um, propagating Peperomia because however you propagate them they always do it wrong. Uh, not, not wrong, but they always do something just weird. So I propagated a Piccola Banda, another great Peperomia. The, uh, the Peperomia Hope is just so forgiving of both underwatering and overwatering because it's got su such a succulent leaf that they're just a great gift slash plant for beginners. I don't like getting people plants gifts because, especially as somebody that's like known as a plant person, I, I feel like there's undue stress on them to keep them alive when in reality... You know, once you give somebody a gift, it's up to them what they do with it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be checking up on their plant a year later. Heaven forbid somebody do that to me. Uh, so yeah, I just think they're really cool. So um, yeah, where was that? The pickle lavender. So when if you propagate peperomia in water, uh, I did it in the air garden by the way, and it's so quick. But the leaves always decide that they're gonna grow underwater. I don't know if peperomia can grow like indefinitely underwater or if they just rot because I always used to assume they'd just rot and then I'm in a hydroponic Facebook group and apparently you can grow Monstera adansonii totally submerged. It takes a while to like acclimatize, look at my white hand, to acclimatize them, but you can do it, which I thought was quite interesting. Sorry, I've been for a walk and the long COVID is making me breathy again. Well, right. <laughs> Right, question five. Which plants are best for lecker and which plants can you not put in lecker? You can put any plant in lecker. And as to which plants do best, it really, really varies. And I know that isn't the answer people want because you want me to say, start with this plant, don't do this plant. But I've personally found that pothos and syngoniums take to semi-hydro really easily. And my anthurium also did. I had a Tredescantia, does it have another name? A uh, Zabrina that I did really well in semi-hydro and then just died. I don't know if it was the plant or the, I don't know if it was like something else or the fact it was in lacquer, but yeah, that just, hmm. but it really does just depend. Uh, you can grow snake plants, succulents, anything in semi-hydro. It's just you may have to be more patient when it comes to letting them dry out, letting them acclimatise, waiting for them to grow roots. And often the care for those plants is as complicated, not complicated, but as like, 
thing about Lekka, keeping a um, reservoir in the bottom of the pot means you don't have to think about watering so much. But if you're doing the shower method, which you might have to do for some succulents so they don't get root rot, you don't have the reservoir and I, I just wouldn't do that. So um, any plant could possibly work in Lekka and you may need to try a few. I really recommend if you want to get into it but you're too scared to transfer them is just start with propagations because that way they've all like they've kind of always grown up that way <laughs> if you see what I mean. <laughs> if you take a cutting propagate it in Lekka and then just keep keep it in Lekka then um, you're not gonna risk transplant shock. I'm really struggling with my words today. I need elocution lessons. I try and get all my words out at the same time. You've probably noticed uh, rather than you know doing words one by one I just try and like them all out at the same time. I can only apologise. I'm trying to improve but I'm excited. Right, next question. I get asked this a lot and I didn't think I had one, but when I thought about it, I was like, mm -hmm, it's you. And that is, what is your favourite plant? And I'll get in for you. I don't really talk about them very often. This is just a Marble Queen Pothos. You can see she's starting to... I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my God. You can see she's starting to revert a bit. I just love it so much. Like this plant. Yeah, so you can see that there's, there's green bits on the stem. You can't see because of all the all the light. You can see like there's some, we're getting a bit of half moon action here. But I don't think it's, I mean it probably is a light issue to be honest, but it's not leggy. So I think there is enough light. Um, this white vine. So this grew, I can't remember which is the original vine. I think it's this is the original vine. And then this one all of a sudden just took off. When I put it in, this isn't proper lacquer, this is that weird brown stuff. But apparently, loads of people say it doesn't work, but works fine for me. Are you dry? Yes. Oh, look at those roots. Luckily, my boyfriend did a water change on the fish tank this morning, so we have some fish tank water. I do use um, general hydroponics. Does it sound like I'm having a wee? Um, I'm not. This, um, yeah, I do use general hydroponics nutrients on my lacquer plants. Not, I don't have any particular timing for it. I'm gonna put you here. <laughs> when no one can see you. Where would I have to put it to put it? I really struggle with um, what fits in my camera frame. Well, that looks awful. There you go. Look how bright you are. Uh, the sun's creeping around. So yeah, second favorite plant is my Enjoy. I love this thing. Um, I love how I, because it's in a terracotta pot and it's not that big, it um, dries to a crisp and looks like it's dead more often than uh, it should. But the, if I sit it in water about an hour later, it looks like nothing's happened. It's incredible. It's like, it's like a plant that wants to be a diva, but she also doesn't want to die. So she's like, I'm really sad. No, I'm not. I'm fine. That made no sense, but she's a good, uh, enjoys a good. I, I just like pothos. I like, I like a cheap plant. Um, I love my Thai constellation. She's my most expensive plant, even though she was under a hundred pounds. I have zero interest in spending more money than that because the stress is not worth it. God, that rubber plant is dry. If you want to know what dry rubber plants look like, to start, oh my God, the leaves look like paper. Have you seen these roots? The leaves go really thin, but also she just stands up like. That was my shoulder clicking. Um, so what I might do is, did I water it this morning? Yes, I did. But not very well. The problem with, so when I did the last soil mix, I put way too much perlite in the soil, which isn't a problem because perlite does hang on to water, but you have to pour the water quite slowly. Otherwise it just runs through. It doesn't have chance to absorb. Right, you go over there. Right, best ways to get plants to grow bigger. 
give them more light. I know that isn't the answer that people want, but that is the one thing that will work. And I say it's easy to do. You can get a grow light switch on it, that is easy. But if you can't, don't want to buy a grow light, can't afford them, can't afford the electricity, don't want to run the electricity, which all of which perfectly viable, I don't know what to tell you. Because that is, plants get their energy from the sun. We know this. So that is how to get them to grow bigger. You can't water them more, you can't feed them more because that is, it's not supplementary because they do need water and they do need, addi they do need additional nutrients. But those things cannot compensate for lower light. They just can't. And plants have ways of coping with lower light that aren't aesthetically pleasing to us, such as like growing really leggy like this. <laughs> But like, if you like that, you can see where I've I moved her and she started growing more leaves in like the clusters because she's got getting more light. But yeah, there's just no replacement to light. And it's, it's I say it's a shame, like that's how plants work. But that is a question I get asked so, so much. How can I make my plant grow bigger, but I don't have a very good light? You can't really. There's stuff you can do to like maximise the situation that you have, but it there's like a cap on it. So on that depressing note, we'll move on. How to increase humidity without a humidifier. I have written an article on this, and if I remember, I will link it below. But if your ambient humidity is below 40 and you don't have a humidifier, I would just stay away from those plants that love humidity. Um, there's plenty of plants that are perfectly happy in lower light, in lower humidity levels. And if you're dropping, so if you decide you want a Monstera oblique, if you're spending like three grand on a plant or whatever, you could probably fork out for a humidifier as well. Uh, other than that, I would just stick with plants that don't require high humidity. And there's plenty of them. I uh, like pothos and stuff. Yeah, they prefer a higher humidity, but they are really not that bothered. Um, there's things you can do like um, leaving out pebble trays, misting, with, uh, putting plants in the bathroom and that can raise humidity for uh, an amount of time. What what it does, how much it raises humidity does depend. Like misting, you raise the humidity for seconds, minutes, somewhere there. You can dry your washing, like so all my plants are in here and I also dry my washing in here. That's not ideal. It does raise the humidity but it also really increases your chance of getting mildew, which I have to keep an eye on. But that's another thing, you really just have to bite the bullet and accept that some plants require high humidity. There are some plants that you'd think would and aren't that fussed. Ferns is one of them. Ferns are quite happy to have inconsistent humidity, which is why I keep my maidenhair fur. fur my maiden hair fern in the bathroom and she's perfectly happy. Well, she's not perfectly happy. She's as happy as a maiden hair fern ever will be. But yeah, if you're going for like calatheas and stuff like that, just get a humidifier. You don't need to run it all the time. You can get ones that will switch on and off depending, you can set them to whatever humidity level uh, and they just come on and off depending on whether or not the humidity is at the right. But yeah, no, I would just stick to, not even necessarily succulents, uh, Hoya. Why was that the first plant I said? No, you're actually like quite hum high humidity, but they will be okay at 40% plus. Uh, 60 is perfect, but 40 to 60 is fine. Um, rubber plants, Monstera aren't that bothered. They'll probably grow faster in higher humidity, but they'll grow perfectly fine in lower humidity. I keep looking at the time on the camera, like, do I want to edit a 20 minute video? I've not really got a choice. <laughs> How to keep pets away from plants. Another sad one, I'm afraid. Um, if you've ever met a pet, you'll know they're all they're all different. So there's people that swear by putting foil on their plant pots. That'd be good for keeping the humidity in the soil, reduce your waterings. Um, putting them up high. Uh, I like the putting plastic forks in the soil so the cats won't climb on it. But we all know that there will be some determined cat dog whatever out there that just wants to eat your plants. Now I have rabbits, so like plants are their diet. That's what they eat. So of course they're gonna to wanna to eat mine. Uh, I lost an entire Calathea medallion and half an Orbifolia to my rabbit. 
uh, but she proper loved it. So I don't, you know, I don't begrudge her. If I'd left a delicious chocolate cake out, uh, I wouldn't expect my boyfriend not to eat it. Like, that's ridiculous. So, not, yeah, I wouldn't... Definitely make sure you keep poisonous plants away from your pets um, and any expensive ones. Just keep them away from them. And by away, I mean, like, in a different room. But depending on how determined your pet is, will determine on the steps you have to will determine the steps you have to take. You could always just stick to smaller plants and keep them in like one of those greenhouse cabinet things. There isn't like one tried and tested method to do it. I'll, I'll link an article below that I wrote about um, the various things you can try, but I do emphasize you can only try them, they might not work. It will massively depend on how much your cat wants to chew your plant. Um, especially, so, one of the methods you can try is um, giving your pet something that they would, that they can eat. So they leave the other plants alone. And one of the things you can get cat grass. And a lot of cats would prefer to eat cat grass than other house plants, so fine. But spider plants, if you didn't know this, uh, if cats eat them, it gets them a, a little bit buzzed. And you can't expect a cat to leave the spider plant alone if it feels a little euphoric after eating it. Like, it's just, it's not gonna do it. So it's better to just keep them separate. And I know, like, that's difficult, but that is the only, that's the only thing that's definitely gonna work is don't let them have access to each other. I also run a house rabbit website and um, so many people wanna know how to stop rabbits eating their sofa, weeing on their bed, eating their skirting boards, you can't, like, nothing will stop them. That's just what they do. You can't reason with them. You can't tell them. You just have to try various things, you know, soap. <laughs> My favourite one for rabbits is give them something. Just it's, They say it with dogs as well. It's because they're bored. Give them something to play with. You yeah, but they don't want to play with the thing you gave them. They want to play with the thing they're not allowed to because that's how they work. Like, that's just life, isn't it? So, yeah, no good news on that one either. All right, we've only got two left. One of which is a bit of a non-starter. Uh, so, uh, why are variegated monstera so expensive? They're expensive because everybody wants them. And it's just, it's not down to rarity. Specifically, no, variegated monstera deliciosa, so like the Arbo or the Thai constellation. Neither are rare at all. They are common. There are many, many thousands of them. Um, they are very high in demand, therefore people can charge a premium for them. I mean, people charge a premium for regular green monstera, so yeah. Um, this hasn't been confirmed, but it's pretty common knowledge that the nurseries in... My house is making... Oh, it's the wind. The nurseries that grow them limit the number that they put on the market at any one time. This stop... Basically, this stops everybody getting one. If everybody has one, they're not worth as much because supply has met demand. We need to keep the supply above demand. Well, we don't, but the growers do to keep the prices high. Um, so it's it's really just economics. It's got nothing to do with the rarity of the actual plant. Rare plants are expensive because they're rare. Uh, often, like they, if they can't be grown very well in nursery conditions, they're rare. Uh, which is ridiculous because if they don't grow well in nursery conditions, they're certainly not going to grow very well in, in a house unless you're like a botanist or something, uh, which is why I don't buy rare plants. So yeah, uh, so that is the Albo monstera. So the Albo, that's just a genetic mutation. Um, it happens in a lot of plants. If you go for a walk and you look at wild plants, you often see variegation in the wild. It if it doesn't have a detrimental effect on the plant and the plant is getting all the nutrients it needs, it'll keep growing variegated because why, why not? But often, because the plant can't photosynthesize enough because it hasn't got as much chlorophyll, they die. So it's not like a beneficial trait. So yeah, that's just a mutation. It is unstable, which means you may buy a variegated monstera and end up with a green one if you don't give it enough light or it just decides. So what the clever people in science did was develop the Thai constellation which is genetically modified. Uh, I'm assuming they have a few massive mothers somewhere and they just take and they just use the mothers for tissue culturing 
So all Thai constellations are clones of however many mother plants they made. I don't know. I assume there's like one master one somewhere. That'd be cool. Uh, yeah, somebody messaged on my blog asking me if... So their Thai constellations gone to seed. Oh, they said it had gone to seed. I'm assuming it's fruited. They do fruit. I've seen po uh, pictures on Reddit and their fruits are also variegated, which is exciting. I don't... I couldn't find an answer, but I don't believe it will actually produce seeds. And from what I can tell, if it did produce seeds, if you grew it, they would probably be infertile. A lot of genetically modified stuff is. Um, but they may well... If they if they were fertile, the chances of them producing a variegated baby are minimal. I think if it could be done, there would be a lot of people doing it. Because it isn't that hard in if you've got the conditions to get plants to fruit. So people would be doing it if it could be done. But congrats on getting your tie to fruit. Mine barely grows at all. Just grows roots, which is fine. Uh, it used to be like like soil roots. Uh, but currently we're on aerial roots, which is exciting. I don't know why. I don't know why. It's like no leaves, no leaves, only roots. Okay. So yeah, because the Thai constellation is tissue cultured um, and it doesn't revert, those things make it both cheaper and more desirable to the consumer. Only a certain kind of consumer. I know there are a lot of people who wouldn't touch a Thai constellation with a barge pole because it isn't like a proper variegated monstera i don't care i just think they look cool like no shade i don't you do you i'm pretty sure the prices of thai constellation will go down a lot i mean some places in the world you can pay an absolute fortune for them i got a really good deal on not a good deal it was just cheap at the time pre-pandemic <laughs> then they shot up again uh, i know i don't want to mention like the cost of arms thing cost of arms okay I'm, she says mentioning it uh cost of arms they've got size they've got them they're ready to sell them but i think they just keep i don't know if they're not ready or they're just pulling it back oh my god are we on half an hour <sighs> we're just pulling it back and pulling it back and they reckon now like 2023 but yeah if you want to variegate monstera just keep hanging on don't pay an absolute fortune for it unless you know you can keep it alive so yeah they will stay expensive until everybody that wants one has one even though they are not rare right last question oh my god this is gonna take so long to edit I know you're watching this going, but your editing is like crap. I know, but it still takes ages. Even like the absolute bare minimum I can manage takes ages. And you've got to watch your own face. So yeah, do I recommend plant tra trapping? Plant tracking apps and which ones? I've never tried one. Really should, shouldn't I? If you have any recommendations, please leave them below. My issue with plant tracking apps is unless they come with a little robot that goes around and checks my plant soil, they're not gonna know. The most they can do is remind me to go and have a look at my plants. And I'm pretty sure like a regular reminder app or my own alarm could do that. So yeah, I do like the idea of like a plant journal, but not enough to actually make one. I love the idea of journaling and I quite often buy a beautiful new planner in January uh, and then get bored between like the 15th and the 21st. Like, it doesn't last long. I'm one of those people that loves, like, the setup. I love, like, the colour coding and, like, organising everything and working out, like, what's going to be the best way to lay out my daily page and stuff and then just never actually getting around to using it. So, yeah, I've heard good things about the planter app. There are others, none of which I can remember right now. <laughs> if you have any, any recommendations, like, leave them below and I'll try them. Paid or unpaid, I'm not. If they help me look after my plants, I'm willing to pay, like, a small amount. But I just don't i'm kind of skeptical as to how useful they would be i apologize for the long rambly nature of this video thank you so much for watching i will see you next week when hopefully the weather will be less crazy and my oven will be fixed thank you so much for watching bye